friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Reinhard Haas, and it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you here on behalf of the Austrian Association for Energy Economics and the Technical University of Vienna. We are here in the old premises of the former Austrian-Hungarian Empire. However, the empire is over, the empire is gone, the walls still remain. It's really a great pleasure for me to have now the opportunity to discuss with you in the next days one of the most severe problems of mankind. And it's the energy problem, it's the climate problem. We will discuss on how to head towards sustainable energy systems. And the question is, by evolution or by revolution? In this context, an approach of new thinking is required. And though, given the surrounding, we can also say an alternative topic of the conference is new thinking in old wars. We are here in Vienna, and if you have the time, aside of the parallel sessions, I suggest in any case that you try to visit one of the famous Viennese coffee houses. It is what it was the center of poets, of authors, of thinkers, and it has the atmosphere that provides also many new ideas. And we are thinking about the future. We will discuss here about the future. And in this context, I think a citation of an Austrian poet of the last century, Jura Seufer, fits quite well because he said, forecasting is always very difficult especially if it concerns the future. Next, I would like to invite the president of the International Association for Energy Economics, Ricardo Ranieri from Chile, to tell us some words, to give us some words from the International Association. Ricardo, please, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Reinhardt. Uh, good morning. It's a great pleasure to be here to welcome to this uh, 15th uh, International Association European Conference uh, 2017. Uh, I want to thank uh, the organizers for the great efforts, uh, years of work to put together this conference where we have about uh, nine uh, plenary sessions, uh, 60 concurrent sessions. Uh, we have a, a great poster session. Uh, during this event, you will participate, you will exchange ideas, uh, you will be networking, uh, and also for the International Association, uh, for the European chapter is an opportunity to, to work, uh, for example, yesterday we have a very important uh, council meeting here in Vienna. Uh, on the days to come, uh, we are going to have a meeting of the European affiliates. So as the conference go on, also the association keeps working, planning for future events uh, for uh, our publications. So we are very busy all year round. I will take the opportunity, uh, and it's something that is very important for the success uh, of our event, to thank our sponsors, uh, uh, VN Energy, uh, Ostrich uh, Energy, uh, Linz AG, E-Control, Kellogg Energy, AG, Energy Steinmark, and the uh, uh, APEC OPEC Fund for International Development, who has been sponsoring the association for many years 
and they have made possible the participation of the students. In this time, we have five students that have been that are coming here with uh, support from the uh, Office Fund for International Development. And as well, I want to thank, uh, uh, we have uh, 24 other students who have received some uh, support in terms of uh, fee waivers for uh, the association. Uh, I will be very brief. Uh, I will make a presentation, I think, on uh, today in the evening regarding uh, some ideas where we are in the association. And I will tell you a little bit more at that time regarding our upcoming events. So for now, uh, welcome to the 15th IAE European Conference heading towards sustainable energy system, evolution and revolution. Uh, Reinhardt already put the question. Uh, one of the most challenging issues we have today relate with climate change and how that relates with energy. That is a big challenge and we hope we can get some answers, some ideas how to go forward in the coming days. So thank you, welcome, and the event happened because you are here, so you are the center of this association. So thank you. Muchas gracias, Ricardo. Next, I would like to invite Thomas Irschik. Thomas Irschik, former CEO, of Green Energy, and he was one of the persons who contributed most to the success of this conference, especially in financial terms. Thomas, may I ask you to invite? Okay. Dear ladies and gentlemen, as current president of the Austrian Association for Energy Economics, I feel honored to welcome you to Vienna and the 15th European Conference of the International Association for Energy Economics. Before we starting with the subsequent sessions, I'd like to ask you to follow me on a short journey through time. Imagine our planet Earth in year 2100. Climate protection plans have failed. The quantity of CO2 within the atmosphere has more than doubled. Average, average temperature increase is more than four degrees compared to the pre-industrial level. We all know and have read about the consequences of such a scenario. Despite this knowledge, and 25 years after Rio, and 18 months after the World Climate Conference of Paris, it is still necessary to organize conference, conferences like this one here today, and on the next days, on sustain sustainability, energy efficiency, renewables, and less polluting mobility. That leads me to the questions. Are we are not serious enough about these topics? Are our efforts not strong enough and fast enough? What about the present political support? When even major politicians even deny the fact of climate change. I am very proud that this conference is held in Vienna the so-called smart city of Vienna, a city with commitment to meet the requirements of the Paris Treaty. I'm proud that at this conference, there will be more than 300 presentations. There is a vast number of new and innovative ideas to make our energy system more sustainable and our energy usage more effective. I want to thank the organizing team, especially Professor Reinhard Haas and his team. I want to thank the great number of companies that sponsored this event, especially the major sponsor partner, Wien Energy. Let me wish all the speakers and all attendees at this conference very successful and encouraging days in Vienna. Let's try to make 
sustainable energy systems come true. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Another important sponsor and a very important organization in Austria to head towards sustainable energy system is the Climate and Energy Foundation. And the CEO of the Climate and Energy Foundation, Therese Vogel, has prepared some welcome words for us from the client. Therese, please. Yeah, thank you, Reinhard. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's really a pleasure for me to be here with you and there's quite a number of you. Uh, and we're also glad to be partner of the IEAA 2017 conference because energy transition of Austria is the task of the Climate and Energy Fund. And this is since 2007 when we were established by the government. And uh, since that we have given a number of one, more than 110,000 projects funding. And it sounds important, among them around 40 smart cities and 90 climate and energy model regions. It sounds impressive, but at least uh, it's not enough to talk really of an energy revolution, to be honest, because uh, there is space for improvement and there's a lot more to do. Transition, from our perspective, seems to take more than a century, because Austria has a strong backbone of energy infrastructure. You have mentioned it, uh, Thomas Jerschik. Uh, and we think we should, I, I think we should use that for the transition path, but at least it will not be done within a few weeks or, or months. But from our perspective, we have also learned, and I think this was also what Reinhard mentioned and what you mentioned, we have to be aware that we should do the first steps very, very immediately and go on into a common future which we agree on uh, renewables. From our perspective and out of our experience during the last decade, the role of the energy intensive industry in Austria is very important for that uh, future based on renewables. Because uh, this is uh, one of the last uh, branches where we do not have the solutions by now. There really is demand for research and development. And we're not, we're at the moment it's not very clear on what technology the future will be based. But we know we have to transform also this, this sector. Another part is the participation of the citizens in Austria in the energy transition procedure, because uh, at the moment I, I like to say that uh, the energy, the Energiewende, the energy transition is a kind of a project for the elite. Not everyone can attend. Some are not able because they cannot pay for the new innovative technologies. Some others are not interested, and so on. So there's really a lack on participation, and we also have to work on that. From that pers perspective, I'm looking forward to the discussions of the next days. And I expect from you, and from Reinhard Haas at least, uh, the answers to some, some questions I have marked now. The first question, which I would like to have answered by you, the experts, is how to go on with this energy-intensive industry. Do you have any, any ideas? I would look for recommendations from your side. How to handle new te technologies like, example, blockchain uh, in this, in, 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 and their role for industrial supply, for example. And how to minimize rebound effects, because what we also have learned during the last decades, there was always a little success in, uh, de in, in decreasing uh, energy consumption, but a few years later it has gone and, and we have more demand than ever. So Reinhard, I think, uh, and I hope you will give some answers after this conference. And I hope also for you that you have fruitful discussions and, and good perspectives for the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Therese. I have made the list. I will send the answers by Tuesday, uh, Thursday, maybe. The last part of this introduction of this opening session is a video from our Minister for Innovation and Technology, the Minister for Innovation and Technology and Transport is supporting these activities very strongly. Unfortunately, our Minister didn't have the opportunity to be here personally, but we will now see the video.
Dear ladies and gentlemen, as Minister for Transport, Innovation and Technology, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the 15th IEE European Conference. I'm proud that we are hosting this year's conference in Vienna. With the Paris Agreement, we committed ourselves to limit global warming. It was the Paris Conference that can be seen as the kickoff for a global transition towards CO2 neutral energy technologies. Decarbonization requires that we transform our energy systems on a global level. For the future energy has to be clean, safe and affordable. I'm glad to say that the transition of the energy system also provides an opportunity for Austrian companies and research institutions. The transition gives a chance to securing the international position of Austria in the fields of innovative energy technologies. Therefore, we put a lot of effort into strengthening energy research in Austria by developing a strategy for Austria's future research and technology policy, by cooperating in the International Research Alliance Mission Innovation and by increased public expenditure on energy research. Global climate goals can only be reached if the energy sector also contributes its share. We all know there are big challenges ahead. For now I wish you an interesting conference and I hope that your findings from here will contribute to tackle some of these challenges of our energy future. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. As a general conference chairman, I'd like to welcome you uh, to this conference and to three uh, days of uh, discussions uh, uh, in the energy field. And hopefully we also uh, come up with uh, some uh, solutions uh, for the challenges uh, we have in the future. Uh, I now uh, want to uh, introduce uh, our keynote speaker, uh, Fatih Pirol. Uh, Fat, it's a, a pleasure uh, that you finally made it, uh, that you can uh, join us and we uh, feel honored that you are here. Uh, Fati uh, is the executive uh, director uh, of the International uh, Energy uh, Agency uh, since 2015. Uh, previously, uh, he was the chief uh, economist. Uh, Fatih also joined uh, us already eight years ago at uh, the same conference here. Uh, in those days uh, as the chief uh, economist and the director of uh, global uh, uh, the di director of global uh, energy economics and uh, i think in his capacity uh, as an uh, uh, executive uh, director of iea uh, he can uh, seen without uh, doubt uh, as one of the most powerful and uh, influential uh, experts uh, uh, in the world so in the energy sector uh, we are also proud that uh, Fatih uh, is an alumni of our institute, so he and many of uh, the colleagues, some of them uh, are here, they uh, have been studying in the mid-80s uh, at uh, Vienna University uh, of Technology and he built his uh, foundation uh, to start uh, this, uh, his career uh, on our institute uh, and uh, his Let's say I would say it's his flagship uh, publication. Of course, it's IEA's uh, flagship publication. is the World uh, Energy uh, Outlook. Uh, Fatih is responsible uh, for that, and I would say it's uh, it's his baby. Uh, and uh, interestingly, uh, uh, my observ uh, observation was that he frequently chooses uh, the, uh, the colors red uh, and yellow. Uh, and uh, also the latest uh, edition in 2007. Uh, uh, is dominated by these two colors and uh, I think he, he, want to he wants to make some reference uh, to his favorable football club uh, Galatasaray Istanbul. So, so Fatih, thanks again for being here. Uh, we feel uh, honored and the floor now is yours.
So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, many thanks, uh, Hans, for this kind introduction. So I will be telling you a, a, a few things um, about the world, energy, climate, which are very important issues for the entire world. But before that, a few words which are important for me. As Hans mentioned, uh, I studied uh, my uh, master's and PhD at the Technical University of uh, Vienna. And, uh, the, the Institute of Energy Economics. And I am uh, very, very thankful to that uh, institute and the uh, colleagues over there. I learned a lot, and I am very thankful to the Austrian government that enabled my uh, studying by a scholarship. So this is a in my view, uh, perhaps a bit of information for some governments who are looking at the R&D budgets and the scholarships. If you give some support to the young researchers, one day they may well come and make a, a return this uh, contribution uh, back. So uh, many thanks to Austrian government and many thanks to Institute of Energy. Reinhardt himself, I don't know Reinhardt disappeared. Okay, he is here. Uh, Reinhardt himself at Melat, and I couldn't see my uh, so-called doctor father. Uh, I, was, uh, I saw his name in the attendance list, but somebody may tell him the doctor Franz Will, to whom I owe a lot. I uh, learn a lot from him. Many of you wrote uh, master thesis, PhD thesis. When you finish your PhD thesis, something is very difficult. In fact, two things are very difficult. One, how do you defend it? This is one big question. What kind of questions they will ask? The second, in my case, a big, bigger question, whom do you dedicate this uh, 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 dissertation? It was a question in front of me, to my parents, uh, to this or that person. I was first thinking of my parents, because they did also support me uh, a lot, as much as they could with their limited uh, budget. But I thought there was a person who supported me in a very, very kind way, because I wrote my thesis in German at that time with my broken German, and he helped me a lot. I dedicated my PhD thesis to uh, Dr. Franz Will, and in his absence, I want to thank him once uh, again for his uh, great support, but in general, to the TU Wien and the Institute of Energy Economics and Austrian government who helped me uh, coming uh, uh, here. So, uh, and I have a lot of uh, stories about my study days. If you want to ask Hans, I will be happy to come to those uh, uh, questions as well. But now going back to uh, energy. <clears throat> okay, now before looking at the future, I wanted to say you a few things, the point of departure where we are uh, uh, today. One thing which is very clear is that we are seeing a major change in the energy landscape wherever you are, which fuel we are uh, looking more closely than the uh, others, or the prices of uh, energy. Last year, according to our numbers, the renewable energy led by solar and wind supply more than half of the global electricity consumption, a major step in our view in the right uh, direction. Second, another good news, I would say, we see an acceleration of energy efficiency improvements. So this is also uh, a, a very good uh, uh, news uh, globally, and uh, uh, we are going to release a report uh, beginning of uh, October, energy efficiency report, there are some very interesting insights why we see suddenly an increase of the energy efficiency across the world, although energy prices are rather on the uh, low side. Also on the technology side, electric cars going very strong, uh, uh, records 
year after uh, uh, year in China and uh, in Europe, uh, we think a very good uh, news uh, as well. I will come to that uh, later. One major challenge we see, and some of you who are uh, familiar with the uh, World Energy Outlook, like uh, Hans, would know that we work on an issue since 15 years stubbornly, access to modern energy services. And what we see is today still more than 1 billion people who have no access to electricity and 2.7 billion people who have no clean cooking facilities. So we think this is completely unfair. Okay. So it means every fifth person in the world, they have no access to electricity. Plus, maybe less pronounced, but as important as that, is that today, 2.7 billion people use wood, agricultural waste for uh, cooking which has serious health implications, especially for women, cause respiratory diseases, among others. A key topic in our World Energy Outlook to be published in November, uh, by the way, it will be on 15th of November, it will be in uh, Vienna, in this very uh, city of Vienna. Another area which Various us, there are so many things very us. This is one of the areas various us is that we see energy and geopolitics are more and more interwoven. And looking at the future, I see almost no reason to be hopeful that energy remains only a business and a part of the economy and more and more geopolitics and energy will be interwoven. As such, we believe energy security remains a critical uh, issue. Now, looking at the, I said, uh, energy uh, scene is changing rapidly. When you look at the first 10 years of this century, where did the growth of energy come from? Almost half of it, almost half of it, came from coal between 2010 and uh, 2000 and 2010, first 10 years. It is mainly uh, China, India, and East, uh, the uh, Asian uh, countries, and coal put the stamp on the global energy demand growth. But when we look at the last six, seven years, we see this shift. One third of the growth, one third of the growth comes from uh, renewables and again another 30 percent from uh, natural gas. The growth of renewables comes mainly from China, Europe and the United States. Gas comes mainly from US and uh, Middle East, but it changed significantly. Renewables and gas together made uh, almost two thirds of the growth of global energy use in the last six, seven uh, years. Okay. Perfect. Now, a few words on oil. I know that the, not everybody in this room are looking at oil issues in a, in a uh, daily way, but oil is very important for many reasons. And, and, there is a major shift in the global oil markets, which is changing everything, including the geopolitics of uh, oil, energy, inclusive, including the price of uh, energy. We have seen U.S. shale oil in a few years increasing substantially. Plus, the, the price you need, this is very important, the price you need to produce that oil was a few years ago, you need $70 to have a shale oil project to be profitable. Today, our analysis show 
a, an oil price around forty dollars may be sufficient a big chunk of this shale oil projects to be profitable. Oil production is growing in the United States significantly. Just perhaps to give an example, Iraq, we all know Iraq, what an important country it is in the global oil markets. There are many things happened in Iraq, will happen, countries going through difficult days because of this or that reasons. And U.S. shale oil production only in seven years reached to the oil produced in Iraq today. So in seven years, U.S. shale is equal to one Iraq. And as you know, uh, Iraq is a wonderful country with a lot of oil and gas uh, resources. So in the next years to come, we expect the U.S. shale oil still be important and changing to oil industry dynamics uh, substantially. Now, the second field I want to look at the natural gas. We see a natural gas, a second natural gas revolution. Some of you may uh, uh, know, who follow again the world energy at the cloud uh, here. In the year 2009, 2009, we said in the world energy outlook, uh, a silent revolution is happening in North America. It was, we mentioned, the uh, shale revolution. And that silent revolution, ladies and gentlemen, became very loud now. U.S. is producing substantial amount of shale gas. I talk about one Iraq shale oil, and shale gas production of U.S. today is equal to two Qatar. They produce only shale gas, not the total gas production of U.S. Only shale gas production of U.S. is equal to two Qatars. And this growth and the export of now the LNG from U.S. is the second gas revolution, we think. The first one was the shale gas revolution. Second revolution will be the LNG revolution. So as you know, all of you, the, you export gas or trade gas in two ways, pipelines and LNG. Okay. So just beginning of this century, the, about three-fourths of the gas trade was made by pipelines and uh, rest by LNG. And today, we see LNG share increasing, and it will be the main way of transporting gas in the future. It is not only U.S., but also Australia. Australia is moving uh, very strongly in terms of the uh, LNG. And these numbers, ladies and gentlemen, not forecasts, a big chunk of it for the next 10 years, they are projects which are now under construction. From U.S. plus Australia, in the next few years, we expect about 150 BCM of LNG coming to the markets. This is a good news for many importers and maybe not as such a good news for the pipeline gas exporters. And we believe the lots of LNG coming to the markets will change the gas market dynamics, ranging from prices to the contracts. How, how the LNG contracts are made, especially in terms of bringing more flexibility in the market. So this is the, what is happening in the gas markets. I mentioned the renewables. Many countries, especially wind and solar, they are pushing uh, very hard, and the share of wind and solar in many countries are growing substantially. An excellent news for environment, an excellent news for uh, energy security. Why it is happening? Very simple, government support. 
government support was number one. As a result of that, we have seen technology made these tech, uh, uh, wind and solar much cheaper compared to several years ago. Our numbers show that the solar cost in the last five years decreased by 80% and wind decreased on average about one third. Huge cost declines. So this is a very good news. We are very happy with that, but there are two points that we think needs further attention. In fact, I should make a, a three. Number one, even though the cost of solar and wind going down, it will be, in my view, too premature to declare, to declare that wind and solar, they do not need government support anymore. That's number one. This, this is the message to governments and also to the, uh, uh, the uh, to industry. Number two, now the growing share of wind and renewables, this is very good, but at the same time, given the uh, nature, the variable nature of uh, wind and uh, solar, we need to secure our electricity systems. We need stronger uh, grids, more flexibility in our power, uh, systems and demand side uh, responses. Of course, the efforts on uh, going on storage are very badly needed, especially in this very picture of growing wind and solar share in our electricity uh, systems. The third message I would like to give here in terms of renewables is the following. We have been very successful as the energy sector to see a strong penetration of renewables in the power systems. But ladies and gentlemen, power systems is not equal to energy systems. There are at least two other areas we would like to see the renewables to penetrate. Transportation, and heat, this heat at home and heat in the industry. When you look at the share of renewables in the, these sectors, they are very, very poor. So therefore, the challenge in my view, or one of the challenges in my view, for the further penetration of renewables is governments puts policies in place in order to incentivize the use of renewables in a non-power energy systems. Now, many of the speakers in the beginning mentioned about the, uh, climate change, the challenge of, uh, uh, as they said, our times today. And when you talk about the energy sector, you cannot avoid not to talk about climate change and vice versa. When you talk about climate change, you have to talk about the energy sector. So when you look at the CO2 emission trends, ladies and gentlemen, they have been increasing year and year and year when there is no recession in the world. In a normal court year, they increased. However, when we look at the last three years, as the IEA has uh, uh, dedicated, last three years, global CO2 emissions did not increase for the first time. Since several decades, global emissions did not increase, although global economy grew more than 3%, for example, last year. Economy increased, global economy, but global CO2 emissions stayed flat. This is amazing news. This is an excellent news. Don't underestimate this. How did it happen? There are many uh, reasons and many factors, but two countries, two big emitters play the important role here. One, United States. US, US emissions fell down substantially because of shale gas replacing coal, because of renewables, 
and because of uh, efficient standards. The same China, big decline in uh, China. So as a result, we have seen something we have not seen ever in the history of energy, that the global economy increased, but the global emissions remain flat. This is definitely very good news, but this is definitely not the best news. What we would like to see as the International Energy Agency, we would like to see emissions to decline, to be in line with our two degrees target set in Paris. This is good, but not the best. So what we, what we have to do is we have to take this good news as a point of departure and start to bring the emissions down to be in line with the uh, uh, our commonly agreed targets. So at the IEA, what we do is one of the things, we check the things, how the things are uh, going on. Many countries made uh, commitments on different technologies. We look at all the technologies each year to track them. Is the development in this given technology in line with our two degrees target or they are slower than what they should be? Our recent uh, tracking the clean energy technology progress report shows that only three out of 26 key energy technologies are on track with a two degrees target. So I want to give you some examples. There are many of them not on track, but uh, I gave you some of them, which are definitely lagging behind the, this two degrees target, is for example, building construction. This is something that I personally feel very passionate about. Today, buildings, first of all, use a lot of energy. Okay? And today, in the entire world, two out of three buildings constructed, there are no efficiency standards and norms, whatever. They just built as they want, the cheapest way. Two out of three buildings. And a building is with us on average in the world about 80 years. So this is, a, in my view, a major area to bring efficient standards and norms for the uh, buildings. Another group, which is not so bad, in terms of the progress is this group. And here, for example, lighting. We are not doing bad, but not also very good in terms of lighting. LED sales are going very well in developing world. And which country leads developing world, or in the entire world, the LED sales is India. Brought a uh, wonderful scheme for the uh, their uh, citizens, and we see LED sales are growing uh, strongly, followed by US, Canada, and uh, some uh, European uh, countries. The good news, which is in line, the technological progress in line with the our two degrees target, comes from, as I said, renewables, storage, lots of countries pushing the storage in North America, in Europe, in Japan, and in China, and of course in electric cars. Records after records every year in terms of electric cars, and as of last year, we reached the benchmark of two million electric cars in the streets of the world uh, now. Still very small when you put in the total car fleet, but there's a strong growth uh, there. Now, again, one of the jobs we do at the IEA is, which we like a lot, at least I like a lot, is to look at the blind spots of international energy debate. What do I mean with the blind spots? Issues which are important in terms of size and the challenge, but not very much under the spotlight of the policymakers. Recently, we have chosen one topic, trucks. 
there is a lot of discussion cars, electric cars, but the discussion about trucks in the world is very, very limited. And we look at the role of trucks in terms of oil and in terms of CO2 emissions. What we have seen, ladies and gentlemen, is that the role of trucks, both in terms of oil and CO2 emissions, are and will be much more important than the cars. I will show you a few figures. This study is carried out by Dr. Gül, who is with me here today, and his uh, team. Just let me explain to you what I mean. This is the global oil demand in the year 2000, which is about all the oil, oil demand for everything, which is about 75 million barrels per day. And this is uh, today, which is close to 95 million barrels per day. Where did the growth come from? Which sectors? Of course, transport and petrochemical. Transport is the critical. But when you look at the transport, when you look into the transport, you see that the share of oil demand growth driven by cars and driven by trucks are the same, 40%. And this is something that is very difficult to understand, that there is almost no interest or policy initiative from the policymakers. Let me give you one example. Today, more than 40 countries in the world have fuel efficiency standards for cars, including the Commission. And I am sure, I am sure my colleague Pantelis, who is one of the best modelers in the world, is going to tell you about this in the EU context. So more than 40 countries in the world have fuel efficiency standards for cars. Do you know how many countries in the world have fuel efficiency standards for trucks? Only four. And yet, their contribution to global oil demand is exactly uh, the same. We think it may be due to the number of cars and trucks you see in the streets. Uh, there are about one billion cars today, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, 60 million uh, trucks. This may be the uh, reason. So, but from oil demand point of view, trucks are very, very important. From a point of view of the carbon dioxide emissions, again, trucks play a critical role. We discuss, and we will discuss, I am sure, today, the CO2 emissions coming from the world's coal power plants, plus the emissions coming from the coal using industry. When you look at the entire coal emissions, coal rated CO2 emissions coming from the coal use for the power plants, coal power plants, plus the coal use in the industrial sector. At all of them together, entire world, in our view, this is equal to the emissions coming from CO2 emissions from trucks. Just to put in a context, and yet only four countries have measures to address the trucks efficiency and the emissions uh, story. It is the very reason I call this as a blind spot of our international energy uh, debate. And uh, it is the reason why we made this report with concrete recommendations across the world, which we released a few months ago with the Vice President Shevkovich in Brussels. Now, I started the, my speech with the importance of R&D, starting from my own uh, personal uh, history and having the scholarship uh, from the Austrian uh, uh, government. And I want to finish with the R&D uh, number, which I feel, I feel very uh, depressing. So we looked the how much the countries and the companies around the world each year spent for clean energy research and development. It was a huge work, I can tell you, 
it is not easy to find those uh, numbers, but I put several colleagues to look at these uh, numbers. There are a couple of messages here. First of all, the overall message is it is depressing. Now, going to the uh, other messages, r and numbers since years and years uh, did not uh, change. The amount of money went to uh, r and a bit close to 40 billion US dollars. It is low and it didn't change in the last few years unlike the interest in clean energy. This is number one message. Number two message, which is more striking for me, or as striking as it is, is the bulk of the clean energy R&D comes from the public sector, not the private sector. I would have thought the private sector, when you read the newspapers and look at the, uh, the advertisements in the uh, televisions and so on, you think the private sector put a lot of money for clean energy R&D, but the bulk of the clean energy R&D came from the uh, public sector, from uh, uh, governments. And you may think it is this 37, I guess, 37 uh, billion US dollars are low or high, some of the and colleagues who live day to day know that it's very low. But to put in a context, the entire world's clean energy R&D spending of all the governments of the world and of all the companies of the world is smaller than the three IT companies R&D expenditures. They spend for the INT, uh, IT uh, R&D. The entire world's clean energy R&D is smaller than the three IT companies uh, R&D and we think it is very critical R&D and the related technology uh, uh, development in terms of fighting against climate change and energy security. So with these words, uh, uh, Hans, let me finish by saying that we think as International Energy Agency, we are built as an organization look after energy security. We think oil security is important. We are seeing what's happening in the United States in Harvey uh, hurricane uh, 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 today. We think, but also new energy security issues, such as electricity security, coming from different angles, including the digitalization of uh, our energy system, will be more and more important. U.S. shale oil, it will make a lot of changes in the global oil markets from prices to the time you need to complete an oil project, how much you need the time, to, perhaps more importantly, geopolitics of uh, energy. We are going to see in the next few years, in the next five years, huge wave of LNG coming to the markets. No way of escaping. Important countries should prepare themselves, use this as an opportunity maybe. Some of the exporting, gas exporting countries may need to reposition themselves in the international gas uh, debate. And the industry, gas industry, need to be prepared that the importers will be much tougher when it comes to the flexibility in the existing LNG contracts. The first half, since Hans talked about my favorite subject, uh, football, the first half of the match of renewables versus the dirty energy is very successful. Renewables are definitely leading the first half. But there's a second half. First half is just the first half. The result will be known when the second half finished, and in my view, second half will be whether or not we will be successful to see the share of renewables growing in the non-power energy systems, mainly in transportation, industry, and home heating. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, 
the CO2 emissions are uh, surely, it's a good news that they are flat now, but if you want to see the rather fragile equilibrium of our planet is maintained, we need to bring those emissions down to be in line with the two degrees. Because when they stay flat like this, then the temperature increase will be close to three degrees uh, Celsius. So to be able to bring it to two degrees, there is a need from, uh, of great efforts, unprecedented efforts, from governments, research institutes, uh, and everybody. And here, once again, I would believe that the uh, stronger R&D efforts will be critical. So I want to thank once again the uh, Teo uh, for uh, inviting me here and educating me in the Gusarstrasse. Thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Fatih, uh, for your very interesting uh, keynote. Uh, so I suggest now that we uh, have a, a few questions uh, after one uh, question uh, of mine. So uh, Fatih uh, will stay with uh, us uh, uh, a couple of minutes uh, afterwards. Uh, unfortunately, he has to leave, but uh, fortunately he discusses uh, with the Austrian Prime Minister, Christian Kern, uh, energy-related issues, the, the, the national and the international energy strategies. So in that sense, because there are many uh, people from academia here, uh, FATI has the ultimate impact factor. So we are uh, writing papers and publishing them and talk about impact factors, but FATI finally uh, is even one step uh, further because uh, uh, what he says, what IEA says, and what's their opinion so, so this has ultimate uh, weight also in real life. So Fatih, uh, one question. So you, uh, in your conclusions, you has been, have been talking about the second half uh, of renewables. And I totally agree there are many challenges uh, ahead. And uh, uh, how do you see, for instance, the challenge uh, in terms of the energy storage technologies? Because we implicitly assume if we integrate wind and solar into the, into the systems, uh, uh, it, it might work. And wind and solar is uh, more or less evenly uh, spread across the globe. But, but finally, we implicitly assume that uh, energy storage also in the long term uh, uh, is available. But maybe uh, we uh, might have similar uh, challenges like uh, in terms of primary fuels in the past that the, the raw materials uh, for energy storage, that they are site specific. So for instance, lithium, so, so that we might uh, be successful to make this transition. But in uh, a couple of decades, we might uh, face similar problems because we are dependent on a few sites across the globe in terms of raw materials. So thank you very much, uh, Hans. I think if I had to uh, put, if somebody asks me, where do you think one of the top R&D and government support priorities should be, energy storage is definitely at the top of my list. The reason is, I think the pace of wind and solar growth and the pace of energy storage becoming mature enough to penetrate markets are not even. There is a discrepancy there. We are not yet there with the progress we have in energy storage to embarrass the big growth now and most of coming from the variable renewable uh, energies. So what can we do? Basically, we can do two things. One, we can find ways to integrate the renewables in the electricity systems without having the energy storage support through better pricing, making more use of the stable power sources, ranging gas to uh, uh, hydropower, and third, make our grids 